welcome and to call the order the Thursday, uh, November the 8th, 2018. The commission is made up of volunteers with expertise or interest in historic preservation, preservation and design. We generally meet on the second Thursday of the month to review cases. Staff to the commission is our urban design and historic preservation staff. They are available to answer questions if you have them, but please do not interrupt proceedings. If you do indeed need to speak with one of them, the meeting generally proceeds with the staff calling the case and describing it. I will call for the applicant to come forward afterward to add to the basic description of the request if necessary or if the application, applicant wishes to do so. If so, the applicant should keep their present, presentation to 10 minutes or less. The commissioners will then have the opportunity to ask questions. At this point, I would ask if there is anyone in the audience who wishes to speak for or against the proposal, the audience comments will be kept to two minutes per person. If there is, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond. This rebuttal shall not exceed five minutes. In most of the cases, we will make a decision tonight after all the information has been presented. If your case is denied, or if you feel that our decision was made in error, you and anyone withstanding have the opportunity to appeal it within 30 days of the decision. If you plan to speak about a specific project, you must have signed in the sheet in the back of the room. Also, so that the members of the public understand, commissioners are under strict instructions to avoid discussing DDRC meetings and applications with members of the public or with each other outside of these proceedings to avoid ex parte communications. If you wish to speak during the course of these proceedings, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth in these proceedings? Yes. He's succeeded. Staff, roll call. Mr. Bachnight? Here. Mr. Broom? Here. Mr. Cohn? Mr. Daniel? Here. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Here. Mr. Wynn? Here. We have quorum. If the agenda order still stands. We've had one deferral since publication of the agenda. That is under the regular agenda under the historic portion. It's 2414, 2416 Lincoln Street, which is a request for design approval for exterior changes and preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill in the Elmwood Park Architectural Conservation District. Otherwise, the agenda stands. Thank you. The, in regard to the consent agenda, the DDRC utilizes a consent agenda for those projects which we require DDRC review, but which meets the guidelines and typically no discussion. If anyone wishes to discuss an item on the consent agenda, I will ask that you speak up after the consent agenda is read and we can pull the item for discussion on the regular basis. I'd like to ask some questions about 1219 Elmwood Avenue. Shall I pose them now or shall I pose them We'll pull it off the agenda and we can post them after the okay. consent agenda has been approved. So the motion would need to reflect the removal of that item to be put onto the regular agenda. Regular, okay. Is there anyone who wishes to take an item off the consent agenda for discussion? I, I wanted to ask questions about the one on uh, okay. Elmwood. Minor. So if, if, if I'm hearing that correctly, that's a motion 
to move it from the consent yes. to the regular agenda, yes. and I'll, I will second that. A second? Yes, I second. Out. Oh. Mr. Bachnight? Yes. Mr. Broom? Yes. Pardon? Yes. Yes, thank you. Mr. Cohn? Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. The motion passes. Uh, in regard to review of cases, presentation of cases on regular agenda. Staff to introduce the first case on the regular agenda. If you'll permit me, I'll just introduce the rest of the items remaining on the consent agenda very quickly, and we can approve those and then move to the regular agenda. You may. <clears throat> the first item on the consent agenda is 1132 through 1136 Woodrow Street. This is a request for design approval for exterior changes and an addition in the Melrose Heights Oaklawn Architectural Conservation District. The next case is 1100 Darlington Street, a request for a certificate of design approval for an addition in the Earlwood Park Protection Area A. 2425 Cypress Street, a request for design approval for exterior changes and a request for preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill in Old Shandon Lower Waverly Protection Area A. 822 King Street, a request for preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill in Old Shandon, Lower Waverly Protection Area A. 3000 Amherst Avenue, a request for design approval for exterior changes in the Oakwood Court Architectural Conservation District. 2001 through 2000 Green Street, a request for site plan approval for apartments in the National Register uh, Structure and Bailey Bill Project. 802 Gervais Street, a request for design approval for exterior changes in the West Gervais Historic Commercial District. This is also a Bailey Bill project. 1530D Main Street, a request for preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill for an individual landmark. 1425 Richland Street, a request for a recommendation for a special exception for 17309C of the City of Columbia Zoning Ordinance. This is in the Landmark District. Portion of 920 Maple Street, a request for a certificate of design approval for new construction in the Old Shandon Lower Waverly Protection Area A. And then, of course, we ha also have the approval of our September minutes as well as the approval of minutes for the special called meeting in that month. And that Mo concludes the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. Mr. Bachnight. Yes. Mr. Broom. Yes. Mr. Daniel. Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Wynn. Yes. The motion passes. So we would now move to 1219 Elmwood Avenue under the regular agenda, an agenda to answer any questions Mr. Daniel may have. This is a request for pre preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill <clears throat> in the Cottontown Bellevue Architectural Conservation District. Rachel Wall, oh, sorry, uh, Megan McNish is a staff member who's handling this project. I don't really think you need to go into detail. I just have one question. Uh, the pictures seem to show that a number of the windows have rotten sills and rotten bottom portions of the windows. Uh, their Bailey Bill application says they're going to deal with 37 windows. Are all 37 windows in the same condition as the few that I see that have rotten seals and rotten bottom of windows, or is that more of a minority situation? Um, they are all in similar condition. Uh, in addition, I got a call from the applicant uh, not too long ago uh, noting that there had been some damage, additional damage to some of the windows. Um, so they're going to be doing their best to maintain as much original material as possible. Okay. The, the issue I raise, I mean, I'm okay with what they're proposing. The issue I raise is the quota is like $25,000 to do this plus another 5000 for other things that may come up. I replace 
windows in 1970 windows in my house in Arsenal Hill, I mean, in uh, Wheeler Hill, that were deteriorating. Uh, I replaced them with historic gel wind windows, similar to the ones they used on Adlu. Uh, my cost per window was in the range of what we're looking at here. They're double pane. They have a metal siding on the exterior, so you don't have to paint them. And they have true divided lights, and they have e-glass. This seems to me to be a, a, a good example of a case where if they've got this many windows in that poor condition, their money is better spent in replacing them with new historic replica windows that are double pane, e-glass, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're wasting their money doing what they're doing because they're still going to have the issue with air infiltration. That can be solved by having interior storm windows, which will double the cost they're already spending. Staff typically works with applicants to just ensure that anything that can be saved, will be saved, but that can't be, um, can be replaced. So in any situation like this where there are multiple windows, we go through and walk through everything with the applicants and make sure we're all on the same page about those. So thank you for the... Um, well, my, my comment is we've already had one historic district downsized because of window issues. Uh, I think if you have just a few isolated ones, that's one thing. When you have 37, I think we really need to look at our guidelines and make some perhaps recommendations that in cases like this, there ought to be an exception to be able to put new windows there instead of trying to re replace or repair windows that uh, are not going to meet the standards of the new windows we see today by gel wind, for example. We, we will indeed look at the windows. This is a Bailey Bill project where they are getting significant tax abatement for retaining historic material as required in all of our historic districts. So there's extra incentive in order to, to get this I understand that. I, I think, though, there are, that, I think that whole process needs to be re-looked re at based on the, the ability for new windows to meet much better criteria than these rehab windows will be. Thank you. Just my comment. I think we would need a motion to move forward on this for approval. Let's make a motion approval. to move forward. Second. Take a vote. Mr. Bachnight. Yes. Mr. Broom. Yes. Mr. Cohn. Yes. Mr. Daniel. Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt. Yes. Mr. Wynn. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. That's going to bring you to the um, next case on the agenda, which is a um, site plan approval and design approval um, for construction at 1328 and 1400 Hugie Street. I'll take care of the um, site plan portion. This project is um, comprised of two parcels, approximately 4.49 um, acres, um, which are bounded on the north by a property owned by Richland County, east by Pulaski Street, south by a property owned by Shree. Columbia Vista LLC and West by Huge Street. Um, the northern parcel is currently zoned C1 within the design development overlay district, as well as the southern parcel is zoned M1 within the DD overlay. On the northern portion of the parcel, the applicant is proposing to construct a six building townhome style, which is attached single family residential units um, development that will contain 27 units. Each unit will contain three bedrooms and two off-street parking spaces. Um, and the parking spaces are located um, in a gated surface parking lot um, south of the units. The southern parcel um, will contain a four-story, 99-unit, 405-bedroom private dormitory and a parking garage. Um, the dormitory will con um, be contain three, four, and five-bedroom units 
and the required um, off-street parking um, for that par portion of the project will be provided in the parking garage. They will also um, provide um, bicycle parking in the garage as well. The um, off-site, well, the off-site improvements contain sidewalks, landscaping, and street lighting um, adjacent to the project. Pulaski Street improvements will be in the right-of-way. Um, the Hugey Street, um, the Hugey Street um, will contain sidewalks along their property, and the northern um, property line will have um, sidewalks adjacent to his, it, it as well. And there are um, several comments notated in the case summary. However, from a um, site plan perspective, staff feels that the site plan largely meets the requirements and can be worked out um, after the site plan is approved through staff. And Lucinda can speak about the um, design review portion of the project. If you want to talk about the site plan first, we can take that and then go into design review. I want to get something clear about the site plan and its use. Gotcha. In looking at the site plan, uh, the road is already there, uh, dividing the two apartments. There, the apartment on the left, apartments on the right, and there's a road running down the middle, right? There's a road on the left-hand side to be used by the apartments and the business next door. Who yes. is going to actually own that road? That, that is a parcel that is owned by Richland County, which was a driveway that was left over from the previous use when it was, um, I believe, the old magistrate building. So the ownership of that will remain Richland County at this time. It will remain as Richland County? Correct. And they'll maintain the, maintain the Richland road? Richland County is, is there. Um, it's, it, it's currently owned by them, and they have the responsibility of maintaining it. So, that, so the, the people who are in the office building at the corner of Hampton and UG have an easement or at least the right to use that, because I think that's their main access Correct. in and out. Correct. And the, and the applicant is proposing to improve their property up to the property line with sidewalk, street lighting, and landscaping. Okay, there's another road uh, it has on the far right, and it said here, 28-foot electric line setback. Um, on the south side, the right of the parcel, it's not actually a road. That road's going to disappear. It's not a road. Um, there's just a driveway. An, it's mm -mm, there's an e there is a, a curb cut at that corner of the parcel that goes into the parking lot, but there is not a road through there. It's just an easement with overhead power lines. Thank you for clearing that up, Mr. Chambers. Uh, I have some questions on the site plan. I mean, sure. is it easier to go ahead and dress those now rather than to do everything at one time? How, however you like to proceed. Yes. Okay. Well, let, let me let me proceed with the site plan. A uh, couple of things right off the bat, looking at what they gave us today, they project 074 spaces per unit. Uh, I don't think that's correct. There are 432 uh, bedrooms in this, and there are 303 or 305 parking spaces, which works out to 0 0.62 per bedroom, if my math is correct. Uh, I'm not sure where they're getting that number from. Uh, my issue with this site plan is several. One, uh, we've got a situation where there's only two accesses and exits from this property. One is off of UG in the middle of the property, and the other is off, uh, on or off of Pulaski. Uh, Pulaski is a lightly traveled road at present with basically serving those who live in the condominium complexes on the east side of Pulaski. Uh, we're looking now at a situation where we're going to have considerable new traffic coming and going from there. The traffic consultant suggested that they could walk, they could bike, 
or they could use the university shuffle. Um, I was running errands today. I measured from the Pulaski Street exit to the, to the uh, uh, Horseshoe is 1.2 miles. That's not going to be an easy distance to, to walk or bicycle. Um, there are limited accesses. One is to Hampton, which is a one-way street going east. Then you have uh, Letty Street, which has a stoplight. If you turn right at Letty Street, you're not going to be able to get out of that intersection with UG because there's no traffic signal. If you go straight to Gervais Street, you cannot turn left. You can only turn right. So to me, this appears to be a traffic nightmare willing, starting to happen. Uh, the other is my office is in uh, Olympia. Uh, I am in the old Olympia administration building. Uh, there are three student housing complexes there. Uh, there's been parking issues ever since that developed. PMC, the developer, recently purchased four tracts of land between our office and the newest student housing project. The day after that, that land became available for parking, those parking lots filled up and have pretty much remained so ever since. Secondly, PMC also owns the Compress at the corner of UG and Blossom. They purchased the building at the corner of Blossom and uh, UG uh, for some long-term plan, just like what they bought on Hayward Street for some long-term plan. But in the interim, they've opened it up for parking, and that parking lot is pretty much full. So I know they're meeting the city code when they designate how many parking spaces they have to allocate, but in a real world situation, these folks have either an individual car themselves or there are several in each unit. And in this particular place, there's no off-site parking where any excess parking can go. Pulaski has no street parking. You can't park on UG, you can't park on Hammond, uh, uh, Hampton, and there's limited parking on uh, Letty Street. So if they miss their number by just a little bit, say it goes to zero, it's zero 062, if it goes to zero 07, uh, they're going to need 340 spaces, which is not what they're providing. So my point is I think even though their traffic study shows there are no issue, the real world issue is there are going to be more cars at that property than what they have parking places for and nowhere to put them. So they either got to do what PMC did and find additional parking, and they're not going to find it in that area. So, I mean, I, th I think real world, this is the wrong project at the wrong location. It was. The, the VISTA plan called for mixed use at this location, not housing, and particularly not student housing. The student housing that is successful is within walking distance of the university. This is not within walking distance of the university. And I think, again, this is just a really poor project. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments regarding the site plan because I know that the applicants are here and can speak to the their application and their plans for parking and that type of thing. Um, yes, Lucinda, where, this paper that you gave us just now or before, who's, who is this from? There's a lot, that letter is from an adjacent neighborhood and um, it's just, you know. I mean, it's not signed or anything, so I didn't know who the group was. No, no, but they've been, at each of the hearings, the planning commission, the zoning hearing, and at the earlier DDRC hearing, all saying the same thing I'm saying. I think the neighbors are here and will probably come up and explain their letter a little bit more in that part of the hearing. Okay. So <clears throat> I think we'll hear from them specifically. Sorry, and yeah. Thank you. yeah, I'd like to hear from. talked about utility infrastructure, so I thought that included the site, I thought that included the site plan. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely related to the site plan. I just, I guess we're not to that part yet. Okay. I'd like to hear from the applicant too, but um, parking, aside from parking, the 
um, traffic patterns at both Lady and adjacent intersections uh, are of great concern to me without street lighting or, or I'm sorry, without, um, without uh, crosswalk lighting, um, green, you know, red, green, and so on. Those those intersections are are troublesome as they are now, but with that additional parking and, and traffic, um, we certainly need to consider that. <clears throat> Any more comments? Uh, how about the, are, are we finished, staff member? How about the applicant? Um, should I ask any of the applicants on this project? You signed in and you said yes. Raise my right hand, yes. Speak uh, into the microphone, please. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Wolf with 908 Group. Uh, pleasure to meet you all tonight. We were supposed to be here in September for the informal presentation with you all, but the hurricanes have scared us off the past two DDRC meetings. Um, glad to be here tonight. Uh, we're excited about the project. We've been working on it for almost a year now with planning staff, Jonathan, Lucinda, John, their colleagues have met with the Neighborhood Association several times over the past year. Um, and have been working with uh, the planning staff specifically through multiple iterations on the site plan and architectural to get where we are today um, and are happy that we have their recommendation for approval and they've placed several conditions on our plan uh, pretty much all of which we plan to meet and work with them um, I guess to address Jim's concerns specifically I heard a couple one being parking I guess, uh, first off, we're code compliant. We're not asking for any reduction in parking. Um, secondly, our parking ratio is about 75% per bed. Um, so three out of every four students, this will be a student-oriented apartment community, will have parking. Um, and for us, I really believe that a large portion of that garage will sit empty. Uh, student housing development across major state universities in the southeast is is what I do. Um, we have operating communities in Louisville, Memphis, Tallahassee, Gainesville, Austin, Texas. Um, our common uh, parking ratio per bedroom is around the 30% to 50% range. Um, and this one will be 75%. Uh, so we believe it's actually too much parking. And in most cases, I would have been here asking for a variance for that. Um, but I know that you know the neighborhood really cares about this project and wants to see it done right and doesn't want any concerns. So we're not asking for a reduction. We're going to build uh, that 75% of parking. And it truly will be more than enough. Um, and on top of that, even in our complexes that have, say, 30% parking, where you really might think it could be an issue for overflow. We have our uh, management company tell everyone, hey, you have to buy a spot from us because we rent the spots. And if you don't, please do not bring a car to campus. You will not have a place to park it. You know, bring a bike, bring a scooter, walk, we'll accommodate you, um, ride public transit. But we clearly communicate that. But with this parking ratio, it, it really will not be an issue. Um, as far as traffic, uh, as you all know, attached to the report is a traffic study. Um, we're meeting all of the recommendations uh, that the traffic engineer told us to meet. Um, and one big thing that we're excited about on this project, and, and I hope the city and the neighborhood is as well, there is currently no pedestrian connection from Hugey down to Pulaski and through to Lady. The Spring Hill Suites to the south of us. For some reason, there was never a sidewalk built that connects Hugey to Gervais there. Um, so really, there's a dead end for pedestrians when they're walking there. 
Um, so what we've done, and, and planning staff has really encouraged us to do this, um, and that's why we're doing it, um, is as you can see, uh, if you're coming down Huji and you go along that unnamed right-of-way where we're built, that the county owns, we're building a sidewalk there with the uh, recommended pedestrian improvements from the planning staff. That goes on and connects to Pulaski. It runs down Pulaski all the way, and then even past our property, all the way down to Lady Street along Spring Hill Suites, we're building an additional sidewalk connection based on planning staff's recommendation. So really, we are going above and beyond here for the pedestrian connection. It's gonna solve a real problem with the city of Columbia. And you know, Hugie, Hugie is, you know, as you all know, a road that you're proud of. It's the entryway to the Vista here. Um, and pedestrians walking along should be safe from UG down to Pulaski, Pulaski down to Lady Street. As far as uh, car vehicular traffic, um, we're following the recommendations from our traffic engineer. Um, and one thing about student housing that sometimes people forget and we talk about a lot is uh, the times of day that these students drive is very different than a typical commuter. So first of all, they're gonna be on the road at different times than most people. Um, second of all, these parking garages end up being like car storage facilities because while Jim made a good point that it's, you know, a mile walk to the horseshoe, give or take, um, if a student wants to take their car and battle for a parking spot on campus, it's going to be pretty tough. You know, they could wait 20, 30 minutes to try and find a parking spot in a garage there. So we're following all the recommendations in the traffic study. We have plenty of parking and we're providing a really good missing uh, pedestrian connection here. Um, those were the two concerns that I had remembered. Is there anything else that I should address while I'm up here regarding the site plan? I've got a question for you. Um, one of the things I've seen at some of these places, maybe you can speak a little bit to it with the demographic being younger. Are you seeing people use more uh, like Uber or Lyft or like I've seen the bikes around Columbia. Is that something you guys were trying to look into? Absolutely, yeah, we really encourage ride sharing. And as you know, students, uh, you know, they ride it all the time. And the, the rental bike programs, a lot of times we'll put those on our property and partner with those specific bike rental programs, which we'll explore once we get a little bit further in the process here. And we'll see, I don't know if those Lime or Bird scooters are in Columbia yet, but they're popping up in pretty much every community. Um, and a lot of students ride those. And in Austin, Texas, where they have it, Tallahassee and Gainesville, they don't have it yet. Um, but yeah, scooters, ride sharing, and the bikes are a big portion of transportation. Good point. I have a question about your numbers. Uh, the thing we were sent by staff basically shows there would be uh, 27 units of the low rise with three bedrooms. Is that correct? Yes, so that's, that's the that's, 81 beds that's of 81 cottage beds. apartments. And then you got a 405 beds, so you got 486 total beds. That's right. Yeah, and you're providing 303 or 305 parking spaces. That, that doesn't sound right. Well, that's what your thing says. You got 276 plus 27. Yeah, we can confirm that here. I'm Laura uh, Baker with Cox and Dinkins. Yes, okay, that's right. Thank you. Um, so I'm the civil engineer. The problem is the different zonings. So the um, north side is zone C1. So that. it will be 27 units, right. and we provide two parking spaces per unit, even though they're three bedroom units. But that is per the zoning code. Um, that's how we are providing that. And then the um, th with the M1 parcel with a private student dormitory is the 75% per bed. What I've looked at is the 486 total beds, the 303 total parking spaces, and I get 0.62. Maybe my math's wrong. I don't get 0.75. Right, but we are not, uh, we don't have private student dormitory with the 75% per, per bed. I understand that, but I'm looking at the total parcel. picture. You got so many parking places that you can park your tenants. And no matter what zoning it's in, you go to get to an issue where you're not going to have enough parking places. I take exception to these spaces are going to sit empty. I walk, I'm right across the street from the mills. I ride by the one on Gervais Street, I mean on Assembly Street, several times a day. Uh, trust me, they've got more than two cars in a unit, typically. 
So, I mean, uh, and, and your site plan also addresses the fact that there might be a university shuttle. There is a university shuttle to Adesso, which is at the corner of Assembly and Whaley. There is not a university shuttle to the three mill projects. They pick, and I see they use, the students use the Adesso shuttle a lot, but that bus takes a right on Lincoln Street just past Odesso. It does not go to the three student complexes. So what I'm seeing when I go to work in the morning is cars coming from the student complex with either one or two people in it going to try to space somewhere on the, the park. They go either turn left on Assembly Street, they turn left on Main Street, or they turn left on Sumter Street. Uh, I mean, I, I you meet code, there's no issue there. I'm just saying this is an accident waiting to happen. And where are you gonna park your people Hi. when that happens? My name is Yao Yu, I'm from Humphreys and Panda, uh, Panda's Architects. Um, I just wanna address uh, the number of parking that you, you were having a question about. Uh, the 305 is actually only the parking for the C1 section. The M1. There are, yeah, the, M1. the M1. Yeah, there's also another 59 space uh, for the uh, for the apartment uh, for the cottages, so that was not added together. Wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm looking at what you provided. Maybe what you provided is different. You say that you'll provide 276 spaces in the garage and surface parking of 27 spaces. The 276 spaces, the way I read that, is for the C1 portion. The 27 spaces is it for the M1 space. Added all that together is not the number you come up with, nor the number you have in your document you submitted here. Yeah, it's like 364. Uh, excuse me. We need to be in the mic. Please use the mic. Oh. I mean, I mean, I'm just raising an issue. You meet code, but I think. No, good point. And we need to, uh, uh, I guess, call it out more specifically on this plan. Uh, like Yao was saying, the 305 spaces is for the M1 big building, and there's another uh, 59 spaces for the cottage apartment. So there's 364 spaces, I believe. But I can, I can confirm. That's right. It's correct, and it's called out on the site plan. Well, if, you the the, 15, if you look in the, the legend, 15, there's a the breakdown of the, not, of the spaces. I, I know, but it's plan. not in this. It's on the site plan. You got this a few minutes ago. The parking spaces are on the site plan, which is which is labeled DDRC site plan, and there's a parking summary, and they break it down by parcel. The C1 parcel with the 27 units, they have 59 total parking spaces provided. Um, and then the M1 parcel, they have a total of 305 parking spaces. Okay. It's on well, the right-hand side. I miss, this seems to be confusing because these documents don't jive with And that's other. our fault. It should have been more clear. You're right, Jim. Um, so the, the parking ratio is about 74.8% altogether, 364 spaces. So apologies for the confusion there. Um, so parking and transportation, any other questions about the site plan that I could answer or provide more clarity to? I think one of the questions I have just on that side alley that serves the building to the left in the plan view do you have a, a plan? I, I haven't seen it as far as illuminated at night, but it, I mean, it would be, I think, just from a safety standpoint, making sure it's well lit. Yeah, good point. So Lucinda and Jonathan are requiring as one of their conditions that we have proper street lighting within yeah. a landscaping strip between the curb and sidewalk to make sure it's well lit. Cool. Thank you. Yep. I wanted to talk a little bit about the site plan and how we got to what it looks like today. Um, we do have a large storm drainage line that runs down the middle that runs down the middle of the site plan, 72 inch storm drainage line, so we're certainly not moving it. And so that's kind of why you see where the, the big building and the cottages have kind of where our parking is is because we're not moving that storm drainage line. Um, we also are moving the sidewalk along UG Street, so right now it's right up next to the curb. And so we're now providing an eight-foot landscape strip with the street lighting and the um, street trees and then providing the sidewalk. So we are moving that. Um, we're adding the sidewalk to Pulaski Street on that side. Um, unfortunately, because the road um, shifts closer to our project 
and with the grading that's going down through there, we can't provide that landscape strip right between the curb and gutter and the sidewalk. So the sidewalk will be up against the curb and gutter, but it is larger than a normal six foot sidewalk. It will be about eight feet, but we have some overhead power lines um, with the power poles that we run into. So rather than um, have people run into the poles, <laughs> we're keeping that sidewalk at eight feet wide. Um, but then we will be providing still the street lighting and the landscaping um, per the city standards along Pulaski. Um, with recent um, iterations with the site plan, this, um, this road to the north will, be, um, will look similar. So it will have new curb and gutter, a sidewalk with street lighting and, and landscaping with street trees through there. The uh, sidewalk is going to be moved away from the road and the old sidewalk is going to be taken up and you're going to keep the trees, the ball cypress? No, we can't keep the trees, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, I think with the construction, especially of the large building, the foundations that are required for that type of building, I'm pretty sure they're all going to be, um, we're, we're going to have to take them out anyway. There's also an existing storm drainage line that apparently runs right under the bald cypress. Um, so I, I'm thinking the city would not want to maintain that storm drainage line. So it's, they're getting taken up, unfortunately. Pulaski Street has uh, different grades. Grade, it's graded differently. Um, have, have you considered that and in terms of stormwater drainage and so on, that, that there will not be any flooding? Correct. So um, right now, as it comes towards Lady, it'll go down to the site to the 72-inch storm drainage line that's running through the middle. So right there, there are points of pickup that exist that, um, that it shouldn't be a problem. But we'll make sure it's not a problem. And then um, with, with the extension from our site to Lady Street along Pulaski, we do have the, the grading is flat through there, um, mm -hmm. much better than on our site. And the road shifts, um, it's kind of got a little curve to it. Um, so we are able to pull that sidewalk back on that portion. So it will be the curb and gutter, an uh, eight foot landscaping strip, and then a six foot sidewalk on that portion where we could do it. Is Pulaski two way? Yes, it is two-way. And will there be parking on Pulaski? There cannot be parking on our portion of Pulaski just because the curve, um, the road curves towards us and we, we don't have enough room to add the parking there in the right-of-way. Any more comments? Thank you. Okay. Uh, support and opposition? That phone? Have you signed in? Uh, yes, I did. Thank My you. name is Bart Walrath, and I'm a resident of the Vista. I have comments on the site plan and uh, just one comment on the design review. Should I hold my design review comment? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, my comments on the uh, site plan review uh, First off, there's no details of the Pulaski roadway improvements uh, are mentioned in the site plan or the review. I, need, I would like to know who's responsible for improving the actual roadway, uh, including paving up to the curbing that 908 is installing, uh, has committed to install. Pulaski will be the egress of choice from the proposed complex. It's not even one full lane in each direction right now. If you look at the picture in the letter I saw some of you had looking down Pulaski, you can see that a lot of the roadway is, Are yeah, there's a pic, that's, okay. and there's a picture on the next page, and you can see a lot of the roadway's been washed out. Um, improvements are needed to that road if you're gonna put 486 residents in there to avoid putting uh, citizens that live there and elsewhere in an unsafe situation and at risk of injury. Another comment I have 
is that there's no recommendations included in the traffic impact study for the intersection that it covers of Pulaski and Gervais. The study incorporates vehicles making illegal left-hand turns at that intersection and states that the peak uh, holding time will increase from 90 to 120 seconds. Uh, the intersection is currently rated at the worst level for an intersection in the handbook used for this study. The neighborhoods have been working with the city and SCDOT to make this intersection safer. And I was really disappointed there's no recommendations uh, in the traffic impact study for this. Uh, matter of fact, a week ago, an innocent bystanding pedestrian who remains in critical condition uh, as a result of a traffic accident at that very intersection. Two cars and one went up on, on the road and on the sidewalk and hurt him. Uh, I agree with the city traffic engineer that the traffic impact study needs to be redone to include pedestrians and bicycles. Uh, I don't think you get a good picture of the real impact of the traffic with, traffic with the current traffic study. As an example, uh, the study reflects only about 60 residents leaving the site out of the 486 that live there between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m on a weekday. I just don't think that's representative of the traffic you're going to see coming out of that, whether it's bicycle or mopeds or walking. Uh, and to step back on the site plan review, the summary lists 25 conditions that 908 must take actions on uh, for approval at, at the end of the, the city's uh, uh, report. They have 28 they have 30 conditions, but some of them 908 doesn't have to take action of. But on 25, by my count, 908 has to take action on to be approved, to meet approval uh, by the city. For instance, that traffic impact study revision that I mentioned is listed by the city's traffic engineer that needs to be done in that list. I just don't think that the DDRC should approve the site plan with those many issues outstanding and 908 haven't even uh, presented their position on them. Okay, I do have one more issue on the design, but I'll... Anybody have any questions? Questions? Thank you. Sure. All right, next. Um, step forward. I want to follow up on what um, you Bar I'm sworn in, in. Yeah, I Thank swore, you. I swear I did. <laughs> but you know, I'm a resident too, and I'm concerned about basically a parking nightmare because I live less than a block from there, and uh, you can just see on weekends and all people parking everywhere, and uh, it, it's going to be a real issue. Plus, regardless of whether they drive or not, you got 486 students trying to get to campus. Um, Bart pointed out the problem there at Gervais and uh, Pulaski. And I'd also encourage you, guys, you all to, when you have a chance, drive down that Pulaski from Lady to Hampton. It's really kind of a goat path. It's really not been upgraded at all. So we see big problems there. And uh, I just wanted to comment on that. And one other thing, we have met with the developer several times, but when the developer says that we met with them, this, this implication that we agreed on something. We have met several times, but there hadn't really been agreement or, in our view, changes that have, um, you know, Please the community. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Any comments? Anybody would like to, uh, to make a motion? Volunteer, please. I'll make a motion. Um, considering that. Uh, City departments have, have weighed in on this and, and uh, voiced approval with various um, conditions. I, um, I move that uh, we approve the site plan 
um, as projected with staff comments and conditions from various city departments. Is there a second? I think we might need to include a few more details on the, specific, the address and do we not need to state what the... You're welcome to, to add those mm -hmm. comments and conditions if you care to. Um, I'm amending the motion to state that the, the, the DDRC approve the site plan to 1328 to 1400 UG Street, uh, a request for certificate of site plan approval for new construction um, with staff recommendations um, on the condition of approval subject to staff comments to include the continuing to work with staff regarding the sidewalk, landscaping, and street lighting along with the northern property line. Second. Second. Can vote. No. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? No. Mr. Broom? No. Mr. Wynn? Yes. Ms. Fuller White? Wilt? Yes. Three, three. Mm -hmm. three, three. Looks like it's a three. Aye. It's a tie vote. Was there a subsequent motion? Can you tell me what the vote is? It's, it's three, three. Three in favor and three against. So the motion fails, so we have to have another motion that we can take action on. Since there's three, three, is there a motion to possibly defer to work with staff to address some of the concerns and come back with a, another site plan, possibly? I'll make a motion. I move that uh, 1328 1400 UG Street that the owner work with staff as, as well as neighborhoods to resolve some of the issues. A second. Your vote, please. <clears throat> Mr. Bachnight. Yes. Mr. Cohn. Yes. Mr. Broom. Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt. Yes. Mr. Daniel. No. Mr. Wynn. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, so we're going to move on from here to the certificate request for certificate of design approval for new construction on the same project 1328 to 1400 UG Street um, just as a little bit of background for this project I'm not going to read everything to you guys since you have a pretty good um, understanding of, of the request but basically they were here in September for an informational presentation so they came and presented their plans they got some <coughs> feedback from the commission um, about you know some of the, the guidelines and things that they were going to work on and the October meeting as you know was canceled because of weather so basically the the drawings and the evaluation that are in your packet are just carried over from the October meeting it has not changed they did submit some revised drawings last week um, that are trying to address some of those concerns so I've put three hard copies up there I have put in the PowerPoint we'll just click through the previously submitted drawings and the revised so you can sort of see what they've done to make those adjustments and then I'll let them come up here and talk in more detail but just to kind of try to better get a feel for what they've done so the image you're looking at now is a perspective of the development this is the, this is what was 
presented um, in September. And then this is this indicates some of the changes that they've done. There was some staff comments about the um, the cornice and the, and the parapet feature. Um, and then I think they they may have started off the dark bronze color, and then they they changed it. And the staff recommendation was that it was more successful as the darker color. And they scaled back the size of it a little bit. And also the parapet wall came down in scale a little bit, and that was a response to some of the staff comments. Um, and this is, again, you can see in the distance, this is sort of looking um, from the townhomes back at the larger um, scale development in the background. So you can sort of see that's the old one, and here's the change. <clears throat> and then this, this one also indicates, so previously you can see this, this is at Pulaski Street sort of looking northwest. Um, so this is the southeast corner of the multifamily, uh, or the, the student housing, the bigger building, I guess. So there, there is a pedestrian entrance you can sort of see on the corner, and there were some staff comments about making that pedestrian entrance just more prominent and more, more accessible for pedestrians from the street. It felt like it was a little tucked away. So they did bring an entrance more to the front of that building and put a canopy over it to address that concern. And just clicking through the elevations, so this is the south elevation, which is, this is against the, the uh, transmission line easement that's on the south side of the property. So it's not a street frontage. It will be visible, of course, as somebody is traveling north on Pulaski Street. And then the, the lower elevation is the Pulaski Street elevation. And you can see that dramatic grade change. And then these are just some, some enlarged um, elevations from the revised drawings that they submitted. Um, again, at the top left, this is the southeast corner of the, um, like if you're heading north on Pulaski Street, you're looking at the south um, corner, I guess, of the parking garage and the, and, the, and the building there, and that's where that entrance was added. And then at the top right is the southeast corner. That's looking, you know, if you're standing in Pulaski Street, looking at the building. And then again, you can see an enlargement of how the Pulaski Street grade change is addressed with that elevation. And then going to the, um, the, the upper drawing is the north elevation of the large building. So this is internal to the development, um, sort of on, if you're standing in that long parking area that goes through the middle of the property, that's, that's the elevation you would see there. And then the lower one, of course, is, is UG Street. So, and again, you can see the grade change on UG Street. And then this is some clips from their revised drawing um, showing the garage elevation. This is if you were um, heading north on UG Street. This is sort of what you would see to your right, is the south elevation. And then this lower portion is sort of an enlargement of what the internal um, elevation would look like. And again, would also be visible if you were heading south on UG. I know this is a lot, but just try to orient yourselves. They only have, I mean, they have three sort of street frontages but a lot of more visible elevations just because of the orientation of the property. If I'm not being clear, just stop me and ask for clarifications. And then here's some just enlargements of the UG Street elevation, so the northern end, you know, the left end, if you will, and then the southern end. And you can see where they've added some detailing, um, particularly along the, just to sort of define that sort of basement first floor level. That just adds a little bit of articulation to define the base of the building. That's a, that's a new feature that they've added to address some of the concern about detail and pedestrian scale. And on the townhouses, this is the previous elevations of the side of the townhouses. And then this is the revised elevation. They've added some more of these sort of shuttered windows to the first floor to address um, adding some articulation which was a comment from staff. I don't think these have changed. Um, but 
And I certainly do want you guys to ask questions, but I'll just, I'll just sort of um, read you what the revised staff recommendation is um, based on the changes that they've made to these drawings since the last evaluation went out. And of course, some of this also is based on the fact that they've had some changes to the site plan. So that will affect, you know, especially how these townhouses are addressing various sides of the property. So the staff uh, finds that the project substantially meets the city center design guidelines with a few exceptions and recommends approval with the following conditions. That the site plan changes and details be reviewed and approved by staff to ensure that new configuration meets the letter and intent of the city center design guidelines. That the architectural elevation of the townhouses be reviewed and approved by staff per the new site plan configuration to ensure street, street facing elevations are articulated in a way that is consistent with the city center design guidelines. That a higher level of finish be provided for the upper floors of the parking garage, screening and details to be reviewed and approved by staff to address section 5.10.1 structured parking. That roof mounted mechanical screening, first floor glass selection and all other outstanding details be deferred to staff for review and approval. And a standard procedure, if the applicant and staff cannot come to consensus about the resolution of any of these conditions, that the outstanding items come back to the commission for review and, appro and approval. Um, I guess we can go to one of the main uh, <laughs> corner UG rendering. Um, so we came for the informal presentation or, or Laura represented us on our behalf and we received some free feedback from many of you. Uh, I think overall it was good feedback, not a ton of comments. One of them was, uh, I don't think you, you all liked the cornices and the very big parapet on the top. So we reduced the size and scale of that parapet, which Yao from Humphreys can talk more about. But we listened and, and made that change. Um, we've been working with planning staff uh, on several rounds of comments from them to making sure we had the proper punch window openings uh, consistent with district standards, um, a ton of brick, uh, massing tower elements within the city district standards, and pretty much uh, doing everything we've been asked of um, to, from staff to meet those standards. Uh, so a lot of work has gone into this. Uh, glad that we had some feedback from you all back in, in September. Um, and uh, with the recommendations that Lucinda has placed on this for approval, um, we're dedicated to working with them on all of those conditions to make sure we work with something that's acceptable to them on each condition. Any comments? Yes, I have a comment, but, but I'd like to hear more from the floor. Okay, I just want to address one thing is, uh, Last time when we heard that, uh, I think one of the comments was uh, on the feature uh, of the, the uh, uh, you know, the roof, the cave. So what we have done is uh, we, we went back, we uh, scaled it back slightly, uh, and also uh, we opened the top up. Um, to us, the big thing of uh, doing a project is that uh, uh, we want to bring something new. Uh, I think last time we, you, you did mention that we should look at some historic uh, examples. So I think, uh, you know, the way we try to relate that is uh, by using similar materials. And on this project, specific project, we want to create some different forms and details to, to make it stand out. And uh, I think that's part of the uh, thing is uh, to, for, for place making, create some uh, you know, I, special identity, I think is, is critical for that. So that's, that's all uh, I want to point out. That's why we kept the, the feature. Any question? The question I have is, is with the September presentation, between then and now, has the amount of Hardy Board been reduced? Um, no, uh, we have not. Uh, uh, we, we looked at the surrounding architecture uh, especially uh, the condo next door and uh, uh, the hotel next door. Uh, it looked like, the, you know, we, the percentage of uh, brick that we have is uh, in basically comparable to what they have. 
so we we did not uh, add any more brick would you be more would you be amenable to increasing the amount of brick and certainly we'll be open to that idea yes very good thank you Uh, do we have support or opposition? Hi again, I'm, I'm Steve Henson and I live in the Vista and um, part of the Vista Neighborhood Association, which we have uh, several members here tonight and have all along. Um, and I'm chairman of the development committee. And I wanna make clear in the Vista, we want growth. I mean, we moved into the Vista because it's an active kind of area, but we want that growth, the, the new buildings to look good and, and most importantly, to fit in. And there's just kind of three areas of concern or many, but three major ones. One is that cornice and roof and all, and that it fits in and I'm not an architect, but that's just kind of not the look that you see in the Vista. I mean, there is some, I think in canal side, but that's not really in the core of the Vista. Most places just have a brick, you know, that goes up to the top. So that's one concern. Another very big concern is the cladding of that parking garage. And um, we hadn't seen any detail on that. When you come up Lady, which is a real major thoroughfare, and you look across there, you're gonna see that cladding on the parking garage. And we would respectfully request that this not be approved until there's a lot more detail on what that's gonna look like, cause that's a big deal on Lady Street. And the third thing is what we're talking about a while ago, the amount of brick. We were here in September and there seemed to be a consensus that there needed to be more brick on, on the building. Um, when you talk, and there was also a comment a, a while ago and, and uh, a couple of months ago in September that Renaissance Plaza has some stucco on it, and it does, but that part is, is set back about 70 feet from Pulaski Street. The actual part that's on Pulaski is all brick, and the part on Lady of that is all brick. Um, if you look um, at the office buildings, to the north, they're completely brick, those two. If you look at the hotel, it's all brick. It's not all red brick, but it's all brick. Um, the storage place that's new on UG Street is all brick. The State Museum's all brick. The Trustus is all brick. The engineering place on the corner of UG and uh, Lady is brick. The Publix is brick. The McDonald's is brick. So we would... Um, we think that this is an entrance to Columbia, the big entrance, people come down UG and they turn left and go up Gervais uh, to the Capitol. And it's kind of, we look at it as the historic brick warehouse district of Columbia. So we would just ask that, I mean, we'd like for it to be all brick. That may not be, I don't know if that's possible, but basically this is a brick district and people are coming into Columbia and that's the first thing, one of the first things they see is this building. Again, it's surrounded by brick buildings and we'd like for, for that to be clarified, hopefully, but, you know, before it's approved. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Have you signed, signed in yes. and swear? I did. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Jonathan Comish. I'm the president of the Arsenal Hill Neighborhood Association. Um, I believe there's a, a comment earlier about a neighborhood adjoining the site. That's us. Our neighborhood starts at um, Hampton Street, and I just want to be here to express my neighborhood's unified support of the position of our VISTA neighbors. Uh, we view the VISTA as one of the great success stories of Columbia over the last 10 years. We want to make sure that whatever building goes up is entirely in the character of that district and contributes to that success. Um, our great concern and the concern of our neighbors is that once this goes up, we're stuck with it. That's a building that will be here for the, the rest of the time that I live here and the rest of the time that they live here. And we just want to impress upon you guys uh, the passion we have for where we live and the importance of keeping new construction in the character of the district so that it contributes to the district's success. Um, so I'm just here to express that to you guys and say that we stand 100% behind what our neighbors are saying. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on. My name is Buck or still Bart Walrath. I live in the Vista district, or neighborhood, excuse me. Uh, and I just have a, a summary comment. Uh, the staff list eight conditions in its design report that need to be addressed by 908 for approval. Steve, meant, uh, Steve Hinson mentioned two of those, actually. But um, 
Acceptable responses from 908 have not been made available regarding any of these conditions. Uh, I And I've asked the staff uh, as late as last night. I've, I feel acceptable responses from 908 must be available to DR, DR, DDRC before they approve the design. And that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Sure, come on. I guess, uh, first of all, I just want to make sure I'm familiar how um, both the site plan and this architectural review work. Um, so the conditions that staff has placed on this uh, we basically have to meet after you approve. So we'd be happy to add some more brick along UG on the main entrance. Um, uh, and we'd be happy to do some of things. And we would hope that you approve with the condition and trust your planning staff that we will make these changes. Um, we've already started to make many. We already have draft responses out to uh, Lucenda on many of these and um, hope that you can approve with conditions that you all think are acceptable because we want to meet them. Um, and I don't know if you can bring the, the, the rendering back up. And also, I guess before you make a motion or bef whatever it is, do you guys have any other thoughts on this view that, that you could tell me? Um, we've really tried to make this uh, very consistent with the VISTA and you know hopefully better than a lot of the other buildings. We think it's beautiful. We've hired a premier architect to do it. So just want to get some any more candid thoughts that you, you have so we have proper guidance if we're missing something? Well, I, uh, I, uh, I have the, uh, both the question and the concern about all the, uh, about several of the conditions that are stated here. Um, yes, you will meet with staff again, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, or would expect both for the site plan and for the design review. Um, the increase in brick would decrease the amount of stucco, or not stucco, but hardy board in use. You agree with that? Yes. Um, further concern would be the, the actual mechanical screening of rooftop, both from the, with a, a west view as well as an east view, um, me heading uh, As far as screening the like city. the HVAC mm -hmm. units and such? Oh, yes. absolutely, yes, we will. All, all of those are screened. And, and you're willing to work with staff on both those elements, on all those elements? Yes, sir. Very good. And on the uh, garage screening, um, we already have screening on there, and, and we can add more if necessary, if that's a condition that staff gives us a, an appropriate recommendation and they have to ultimately approve the screening that we do on the garage, we'd be, we'd be happy to do that um, and have some good ideas to screen the garage because uh, the neighborhood was right that as you approach from, from Lady going towards, or from Pulaski going towards Hampton, you'll be able to see a portion of the garage behind the trees, even though it's a low portion of the garage, we'll absolutely make sure we have some nice looking architectural screening with that. Any more questions? Thank you. Yes, sir. Come up forward. Um, and I appreciate the developer working with uh, on the brick and everything. But I just just respectfully would ask that since the site plan is has to be delayed anyway, perhaps we could delay you know reviewing or you, you could delay reviewing. The other part too, because I mean, it's not going to progress until um, the site plan can be approved. Uh, anyway, we appreciate your thinking. Of this. Thank you. My question would then come to staff: Is is there an actual delay in the site plan or or our motion, the last motion, which was approved? for a site plan was that it would be reviewed by you and approved by you or work with you for approval. 
it was deferred. No, I think it was deferred, it was deferred gonna, till the December we meeting. Deferred? Okay. We deferred to, to work with staff and neighborhood. Very good. Okay. Is that? Yeah, I, th I think the motion was for the conditions to be, you know, worked out and then a, a revised plan that reflects those to come back to the DDRC. Very good. Okay. I wasn't clear on that. Thank you. Uh, any, anybody, anybody want to make, make a motion on that? I'll make a motion. I move that the uh, architectural review be deferred until some of the details can be worked out with staff and the neighborhood. So moved. Second. So moved. Okay. Okay, go vote. I guess I, I was just going to ask if 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 y'all could add some specific items that you would like to be addressed. I, I mean. Because there's, I mean, the staff recommendations, of course, are based on the guidelines, and there might be things beyond what we recommend based on the design guidelines that the neighborhood wants. So I think it would be helpful for the commission to be very specific about those items that might be a little bit beyond what we can require from a guideline standpoint. I, I would like to see the screening of the mechanical units as well as the garage addressed. I'd like to see details. There, there's. We, this is the second time we've asked for a reduction in the Hardy Board, and it hasn't been reduced. So, yeah, th those are the two I'd like to see addressed. And I'm really not real comfortable with the soffit yet. It, yeah. I don't know what it relates to in the, uh, the Vista. But, but, yeah. So those are my concerns. Can we have you state that as a motion, then? Did you need that as a motion or just some of the items that I'd like for y'all to look at? Yeah, I mean, I think that's my understanding is those are going to be included. I mean, that's part of the motion, I guess. Maybe you could restate that to include those just so we have a coherent list. Do I need to restate the motion then? Okay. I moved that a decision on the design um, review for. 1328, 1400 UG Street be deferred until details can be worked out with staff and neighbors to include the amount of brick, hardy board, the screening of the parking garage, as well as rooftop units. So Second. Move. Second. Can we have a vote? Mr. Bachnight? Yes. Mr. Broom? Yes. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? No. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Our next case is on the historic agenda. It is 203 Watery Avenue. This is a request for a certificate of design approval for exterior changes and an addition and a request for preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill. This is in the Wales Garden Architectural Conservation District. It did. I'm sorry, not an addition. <laughs> this is a two-story brick veneer house built in 1918 and features a side gable roof, original wood casement, and double hung windows, and a front entry portico with fluted columns. Um, the only requested exterior change visible from the public right-of-way involves the enclosure of the side porch. The original proposal for the side porch enclosure was to remove the existing windows um, seen here in this image and replace them with shutters. Um, staff found this proposal not to be in keeping with the guidelines as it did not maintain openness as the guidelines require. However, since the evaluation for this project was written, the applicant has altered their proposal for side porch to use screens rather than shutters. 
Um, these are some examples that the applicant provided here, um, which staff has found to be more compatible with the guidelines, as the guidelines do state, maintain openness through the use of transparent materials, such as glass or screens, and to place enclosures behind significant detailing. Um, I don't believe the applicant was able to be here today, but he has um, mentioned that he's happy to work with me through uh, figuring out the design of the screens, basically keeping it behind the details such as the columns. Um, so staff finds that that proposal is in keeping with the guidelines. Um, so overall, staff recommendations, two parts. First, for the Bailey Bill, staff finds that the project generally complies with Section 17-698 of the City Ordinance and recommends granting preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill with the following conditions. The project meeting or exceeding the 20% investment threshold requirements for qualified rehabilitation expenses. All work meeting the standards for work as outlined in sec Section 17-698 and all other details deferred to staff. Second recommendation relates to the uh, porch enclosure. Staff recommends granting a certificate of design approval for the porch enclosure with the use of screens based on Section 7 of the Wales Garden Architectural District Guidelines and Section 17-698 of the City Ordinance with details deferred to staff. Any questions? Do we have an applicant here today? They had a scheduling conflict. I just want to make sure. Can I pose a question, please? Sure. Uh, so the, the metal greenhouse that was added a number of years ago would all come off? That's correct? Right, yes. All those, all those yeah, metal windows would come and off. And in its place would be a screen porch, basically? Basically, yeah, similar to one of these images here. Uh, the, there are no existing columns or anything on the front of the house that would hold the screen porch what is in uh, there are existing columns on the porch um, you cannot see them in this image but they match the columns on the front uh, stoop of the house they're fluted columns the columns in the rear but not in the front i think right no there, there are columns on the corners is, of the porch it's just hard to see so they'll basically be attached to that then correct okay, thanks okay any more comments Am I like to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve uh, the request for exterior changes to 203 Watery Avenue to remove the existing metal uh, sunroom and add uh, a screen porch, a porch to be screened in, in its place. I'd also move that uh, approve preliminary certification for the Bailey Bill based on them meeting the monetary uh, requirements required by the Bailey Bill. And this would be per sections. Uh, 17-698. Do we have a second? Second. Cast a vote, please. Mr. Bachknight? Yes. Mr. Broom? Yes. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. The motion passes. Our next case is 2327 to 2329 Lee Street. This is a request for a certificate of design approval for an addition in the Old Shandon Lower Waverly Protection Area A. This two-story, 2,800-square-foot home at the corner of Lee and Meadow Streets was built circa 1912 and was among the first to be constructed on this block. With its primary facade addressing Lee Street, it features a cross-gabled roof and front porch supported by turned columns. Originally constructed as a single-family home, it is currently used as a du duplex. The house is situated on the western side of the lot, creating a large side yard. The applicant is proposing to construct a 1,000 heated square foot side addition with an additional 400 square feet of porch space in this side yard area. Staff recommended to the applicant that the addition be sited at the rear of the structure per the guidelines 
which require that additions do not detract from the principal facade. The applicants moved the addition several feet back from the principal facade. However, the addition remains highly visible from the primary elevation on Lee Street. Staff has several concerns with the overall width of the addition. As proposed, locating the addition at the side would increase the width of the principal facade by more than 65%, making the primary elevation highly elongated and out of scale with other structures on the street and in the neighborhood, making it inconsistent with the guidelines. The addition also creates the impression of a second house attached to the original structure, detracting from the original composition of the structure, including the principal facade. The proposed entrance on the side elevation creates a false second primary facade, which is inconsistent with the guidelines as single family historic residences on corner lots address one street, not both. This approach to have the structure address both streets is not compatible with the historic fabric and architectural style of the original structure as the primary facade faces Lee Street. Aligning an addition with the primary facades of a day primary facades of adjacent historic homes is not locating like elements on the site. A similar request for a large addition on a side elevation came before the commission in March of 2017. While this addition did not create a false sense of entry, it did alter the massing, making it incompatible with other homes on the street. Therefore, the commission denied this request. The applicants revised their plans, citing the addition at the rear of the original structure and the revised plans were approved. In 2014, a large addition to a corner lot came before DDRC for review. This addition added over 1,000 heated square feet to the structure and several new entrances to the left elevation. The applicants used a hyphen to minimize the alterations to the historic structure and clearly differentiated the original structure from the new addition. The new entrances were clearly inferior to the original and consequently the addition was approved. Staff concerns for this project extend beyond the size, scale, directional expression, and sense of entry. Staff has concerns regarding the proposed addition's massing, rhythm of openings, roof shape, materials, and details. While the guidelines accommodate the need for additions to historic homes, they require that careful consideration be paid to the location, size, and detailing of additions so that they do not detract from the existing architectural form of the structure. Staff recommends that the plans be revised and the addition be cited at the rear of the original structure, which can accommodate an addition of similar square footage. Staff finds that the proposed addition at 2327 to 2329 Lee Street is not in keeping with Section 4A or Section 4B of the Old Shandon Lower Waverly Protection Area Guidelines in size, scale, massing, directional expression, sense of entry, rhythm of openings, roof shape, materials, detailing, siting, and style, and recommends denial. Questions? staff? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask one. Looking at the proposed first floor plan, um, it looks like the addition is 25 feet 8 inches wide running parallel to Lee Street and 33 feet uh, going back towards the uh, east. That lot is only 100 feet deep. Um, it, it would appear to me that if you put this addition behind the existing house, you're, you're going to be almost to the edge of the property line. Uh, have you all looked at that and made any determination on that? There is room um, within the required 10-foot setback for an addition in the rear. Excuse me. <clears throat> is the uh, addition clearly defined, dif differentiated in terms of setback and so on from the uh, existing home so that one can tell the difference? Uh, staff does not find that the addition is clearly differentiated from the original structure uh, and feels that it creates a, um, the impression of a second structure attached to the original um, that 
disrupts the massing and um, directional expression. It does. Thank you. Do we have an applicant for this project? Please come forward. Yeah, have you signed in? Yes. Before? Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, the valuable work you guys Pardon are doing. Pardon me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you please state your name for the record? Yeah, my name is Merdad Vejdani. I'm uh, one of the owners of this property. Uh, my fiance, Trace, couldn't be here today. But, uh, and she has lived in this house for uh, 25 years. This is a, a duplex, and uh, we've decided to expand the downstairs apartment so we can both live in it and be uh, homeowners and living in that space. Uh, this uh, property is, uh, is a duplex, has a upstairs unit, which is 2327, with an entrance that faces uh, Lee Street and has a downstairs unit at 2329 with the entrance facing uh, Meadow Street. It, uh, the duplex uh, was created uh, in 1994 uh, by the addition of a second entryway on the Meadow, enclosing a side porch and adding 12 feet onto the rear of the house. The duplex is set on a double lot that has its vast majority of the vacant land, approximately 5,200 square feet, open to the Meadow Street side. So it's, it's on a double lot, uh, and on one side of it's all open. Uh, the current entryway for the downstairs unit sits back over 40 feet from the entry facade of all the other houses on the side of the 800 block of the Meadow Street uh, and 50 feet back from the property line on, on, the, on the Meadow. Uh, the proposed addition will bring the, the downstairs unit entryway facing Meadow into compliance with the design protection guidelines via its facade which will match the other uh, single-story homes on the 800 block of Meadow. And also because it will be in line with the other homes' entryways. Our proposed addition will only alter the 1994 addition and will leave the original 1920s structure intact. This mainly a rear addition will also extend out toward Meadow Street since the duplex sits on a corner lot and any rear addition will be visible. The part of our proposed rear addition that extends to the side is set back over 30 feet from the Lee Street entryway. And, uh, and, 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 and also, um, so that the addition does not detract from or obstruct the main entryway on the original house. Uh, the staff has recommended that we do a, a two-story in the rear of the house to get the same square footage. Well, this is a duplex that the upstairs apartment would be completely blocked by that two-story addition. And the edge of our two-story addition in the rear would be overlooking the neighbor's living room. Just not a practical solution. Uh, we have uh, submitted some photos of some of the neighborhood. This area on, on, on Lee Street is, is, is a lot of duplexes, triplexes, apartment housing, a lot of student housing in this area, and, uh, and just within a couple of blocks of our house, we, we took some pictures of a few other duplexes with entrances on both sides, staircases coming up from the backside and whatever, which is what 
presented but not shown for some reason. Uh, I believe that information is in your packets. Uh, we also took some pictures of the four adjacent houses on Meadow Street, which is right next to ours. And, and of course, we're again sitting back 40 feet back from the facade of those houses. And all of these houses have uh, entrances with covered porches, single story houses, which again, what we're proposing, we would create that kind of a look by extending the downstairs apartment. And we've also presented some pictures of the, the three other corners of Lee and Meadow, uh, and which are a very good presentation of uh, the diversity that exists in that neighborhood. The, the other three corners are multi-story you know, apartments or uh, four-unit four townhouses right across from us. And uh, they all have multiple entrances. So, uh, so we, we uh, originally had planned to have the addition a little more forward, but talking to staff and, and discussing this issue about altering the facade, even though we were six feet back and we thought we were not doing that, we decided to move it further back to 30 feet back from the Lee Street side. So it would essentially would look like a rear addition that comes off the side would uh, match all the other houses on Meadow. And it would, if you look at it from the Meadow side, it would look like one of the houses on Meadow. If you look at it from the Lee side, if you stood in front of the house on the Lee side, you wouldn't see it. So it would look distinct. It would look like it's a kind of a different house. And we have a little indentation on the side of it, so it would make it look Thank you for your consideration. Any questions? Thank you. Anybody about to make a motion on this? Uh, uh, let me ask, uh, at least ask questions <coughs> of staff. Uh, if, if the first floor plan was extended, the addition was on the rear, then it looks like then we, we run the potential of losing a room or try, I, I, trying to figure how it would all work together. Um, this plan shows that he would have a, a room sort of in the middle that would hook on, but I mean, I guess he's got options. It's a double lot. He could build a separate structure next door, but that's not what he has in mind. Two, he could go off the back, but then he's, if it was a one story to add what he wants, but then it looks like he's going to be losing uh, conceivably a space. Uh, and it, then he can do this. Is there some possibility to distinguish the two? You have a different material for the addition from the original so that it, you can tell it's not part of the original building? Are, are you talking in its present configuration? Well, I'm, 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 I guess I'm back to if we, if we leave his proposed configuration. Uh, one way the historic properties have tried to distinguish the original from new is to have a different material for the addition. Um, is, is that a possibility? Um, I, I'm not sure that that, given staff's comments about the multiple ways that we don't see that it meets the guidelines, I'm not sure that that would be a helpful move in the right direction, if you will. But if you do the addition, you're basically going to gobble up his whole backyard uh, and he, he's, the only yard he will have then, of course, will be the side yard, which he has the potential at some point in time to sell, reserving an easement on the back of the lot to access the back of his house. But he's barely going to have enough room for parking a vehicle behind his house if he goes off the back. There, I, 
I appreciate all the things that you brought up, and they are, you know, things that we've thought about. I mean, it does have that secondary lot to the side where there's a lot of room right there. But what we have to do is really apply the guidelines to the project and no, I, keep I, our I, review within that scope. I think scope. if you apply the guidelines to this particular house, you're really creating a problem with him being able to do what he wants to do. But we are still bound to, to fall within those guidelines. Well, we're going in circles here. Um, <clears throat> I forgot to ask, is anybody support or opposition? Okay. Any more comments? I have one further question, uh, <coughs> or a question from the homeowner. Um, what, if you can you step forward, please. Um, what adjustments are you willing to make based on suggestions and, and discussions with the staff? Uh, we, we, again, we had it at six feet from the Lee Street. We have already moved it to 30 feet back from Lee Street. We had suggested that we, the, the original house is, uh, got a vinyl siding, and we had uh, decided to do party plank to distinguish it even further. But uh, their, their objection mainly is any kind of side addition is not per guidelines. Even though you have an entire land sitting there, you're not allowed to use it because the guidelines would not allow you to use the side. You need to make it something that's one third of the floor space, go two story high in the back, block the upstairs windows and everything else for the apartment, upset your neighbor in the back, and leave the entire lot empty because this house is not good. It, it, the house was a single family home back in 1920s, and the fact that it's a duplex now, it seems to be a problem. But we have a duplex, we'd like to improve it, add to it, and the only way to add to it is to do a single story addition downstairs. Thank you. All right, anybody like to make a motion? Yes, I will. It's got to be a more creative way to solve this problem. I mean, we had this same issue on Henry, where the, the owner there wanted to go out to the left in front of a pool. That was turned down, and they eventually added on to the rear of the house. That's correct. That was that was one that y'all uh, was in the PowerPoint just now. Uh, but but that was a two-story addition but they were only affecting a kitchen. In this case, they would be, if they did a two-story, they're affecting both, uh, both rooms upstairs, so. How many square feet could the, a single-story addition be with the 10-foot, if it was extending back behind the house? So I've pulled up um, from the PowerPoint uh, what I recommended, uh, what staff recommended that um, could be done instead. I didn't measure the specific square footage, but visually it appears to be approximately the same amount of square footage. Yeah. The, the picture that staff did there shows an indentation too, which is what is typical <laughs> that we see on additions to d differentiate them from the original structure. So the original structure can be read, the footprint, and its composition from the street view. You, you've used Palmetto Home Designs to do your design. Uh, have you given any consider? I, I know they're, they're draftsmen. Have you given any consideration to talking to an architect and see if they can come up with something that might work better? Uh, well, we, we've designed it once. We've spent a bunch of money design, changing it for sure. a second time. Uh, 
the staff gave us the impression that basically no way, no how, so we have stopped the bleeding at this moment. Um, you okay? You finished with the applicant, uh, Jim? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, again, I'm going to ask anybody would like to make a motion. I guess I will. I I move that the Design Development Review Commission find the fact that the project proposal, um, I would make a motion to deny the uh, case 2327-2329 Lee Street. Um, and, and not keeping up with the section four a or section four B of the old Shandon Lower Waverly Protection Area guidelines. In size, scale, massing, directional expression, sense of entry, rhythm of openings, roof shape, material, detailing, sighting, and style, and therefore, thank you. Second. That's a vote, please. Mr. Bachnight? Yes. Mr. Broom? Yes. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. The motion passes. So under our other business, we have a report on the historic resources survey that was done. Rachel has been um, working with New South Associates on this, and they are here to present tonight. Hi, Stacy. They are hopeful they are here to present tonight. <laughs> there we go. We welcome a familiar face to DDRC. Um, well, I'm Tina Poston with uh, New South Associates. Uh, we were here earlier this summer to uh, propose our survey of the Eau Claire area uh, that we completed this summer, and we completed the report as well in September. So this is just kind of to let you know what we found um, and let you know what was there. Um, so we, the city was awarded the grant um, and then they gave us the job to uh, complete or update the inventory of the historic buildings um, in the city of Columbia focusing on the Eau Claire area. Um, and this is the project area in which they chose for us to focus um, our survey in. Um, so we were surveying everything that uh, was older than 50 years with also um, anything that was built prior to 1975. We wanted to focus on ranch houses, uh, all of those houses that would have recently become um, eligible for the National Register, as well as identifying any new districts. Um, the other thing that we were required to do was to write a report and to do some historical background research to try to, cre try to create a historic context for the city of Eau Claire or the or Eau Claire area. Um, and Stacy Ritchie did that. Good evening. Hi. Hello nice to see you all. Um, my job was to write a historic research context and a context is generally um, to deal with the buildings as well as the history. So just briefly, the history of Eau Claire area is that Frederick Hargrave Hyatt, who you can see here, 
um, bought a lot of acreage two miles north of the city in 1890s, um, planning to make this area a white resort town, basically. Um, he built the trolley two miles up from the city up to this area to attract growth. Um, and there were some very nice, uh, wealthy people, uh, wealthy buildings built here in the Victorian style that you can see as well as Hyatt's house. Um, and also parks and recreation facilities like a club, um, the city's first club. Um, but it did not attract people as he hoped because there was a lot of competition for growth in other suburbs like Shandon. Um, and so in the early 1900s, Elmwood Park is developing Cottontown, and all of this is competing for suburban development north of the city. So Hyatt shifts um, his program here, and by the 1910s, he drafts this um, plot that you can see here which is much smaller lots um, and also the types of houses coming in are much smaller like this bungalow which was built in 1916 which is still there today uh, he donated land to columbia college he was on the board and so that became kind of an anchor for the development in this area which was very slow uh, again with a competition that occurred through the sub subsequent decades so we see a bunch of different architecture here um, slow growth from the 1910s, 20s, 30s, um, with small bumps along the way of growth pockets. This is a 1928 map showing um, the town of Eau Claire, which had been incorporated in 1899, uh, 1899 uh, in an effort to stop a black cemetery from coming into the area. And then the yellow section that is labeled Arden, uh, incorporated in the 1910s, uh, to avoid annexation into the city. That's actually College Place. Um, uh, there were a lot of annexations in the 1910s from the city pulling things up from the north. Uh, and there were a lot of discussions between Eau Claire and the city for annexation for a period of about 30 years. And that finally occurred in 1955. And up until that point, Eau Claire had been probably 90, 98% white and the annexation that occurred in 1955 started a huge shift in the Eau Claire area. Uh, here you can see the original Columbia College building that burned in the 1960s, um, and the College Place United Methodist Church rebuilt their sanctuary in the 60s, so we did have some mid-century buildings uh, that were showing up in the research, but the big change in the 1960s and 70s was that African Americans were pushed out of the downtown city area through urban rehabilitation and white flight and um, um, fighting blight. And so a lot of them relocated in Eau Claire. Uh, the city also put in low income housing in Eau Claire. And so there's a huge change in um, demographics here, but also there are very few businesses up this way. So North Main remained residential. It didn't really grow commercial. And so they didn't have a big tax base, and that's part of the reason they annexed into the city in 1955. Uh, and that's basically a brief history of Eau Claire. All right, um, so just to go over a, a few of our findings, um, we didn't find any individually eligible structures, uh, but we did identify a few prominent house types that attributed to uh, a few of the potential districts um, that we did identify. Um, we looked at some commercial properties, we looked at um, a few churches in the area, as well as uh, a cemetery, um, and then the residential areas that we, we felt could potentially become eligible um, as a National Register District were along Colonial Drive, uh, Miller's Edition, College View, uh, the Burke Holmes area, and Middleton Heights. So these are just examples of some of the house types that we saw in the area that were contributing to some of those historic districts. Uh, these are examples of some mid-century uh, resources that we had in the area, though they were kind of sparse. So the recommendations that we made all followed the uh, National Register of Historic Places criteria. Um, and if you look on the map, everything in green was confirmed by the State Historic Preservation Office as eligible for the National uh, Register. 
um, and that those include College View District, the Colonial Drive, and uh, the Middleton Court, which is Middleton Heights area. The other two were determined uh, locally significant, and that's the Miller's Addition District and the Holmesburg area. We also identified uh, two other area, areas that needed further study that just kind of exceeded the, the limits of this particular survey, and that was the Columbia College area and the Pine Ridge Cemetery. Um, they both had uh, more resources than anticipated. Um, so a lot of the buildings on the Columbia College campus were built after the fire in 1967, I think it was, and then around in the 80s. So it kind of fell outside of the, the year mark that we were looking at. So it could have a good potential to be its own district or also offer information to the community as a whole and its development. And then Pine Ridge Cemetery was located in the north end of the project area. It had a lot of association with the African American community and development within the area. Um, we, so we recommended that further research be conducted to understand uh, the extent of the site and its attributions to the community. We also identified two other potential survey areas for future uh, survey. Uh, the first survey area, there highlighted in blue, kind of complements the the current survey area that we did. Um, it kind of finishes off the, the original area of Eau Claire, uh, which Frederick Hyatt uh, extended his development into that area. And then the uh, second survey area, which is highlighted in, in purple, um, has other um, development histories that started in 1910 and then went into the 1960s. Let me ask about another district, uh, and that's the Cotton Town Commercial District, which basically runs from Elmwood along Main to Anthony, and then it would have Sumter Street as its boundaries on the uh, east. Has any consideration been given to that? Because it's a pretty intact 1940-ish uh, commercial district. It's not in the Cottontown Historic District, uh, but it is the mostly intact commercial district along Main Street that still exists. And it's gone through a significant revival without any tax credits. And there are not a lot of properties left, quite frankly, to be redeveloped. They've already been done. But it's a shame that hasn't been identified as something that should be looked at. Yeah, that fell outside their scope, so. Why is that outside the scope? We only had so much money. Speak up, please. Okay. Sorry, we only had so much money for our survey. So we're working on other areas okay. we're working Thank through. You. There is one house, I don't want to prolong things, there's one house that backs up to uh, the, the, the school, the college on Main Street that's on the back street. What's this empty, vacant, derelict? Any idea what's the story on that? Okay. She recorded over 900 houses, so you oh, okay. have to okay. be a little more specific. Got gotcha. you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your help. Any other questions? Thank you. Nice survey. Thank you. And I do have to say they did this in a very short period of time and did really great work for us, so we are, we are grateful for the work and the Excellent. information we have now. All right. Yeah, call this adjourned. No, uh, no, no. We do have an executive session. <laughs> we do have an executive session. Uh, okay. So you need to make a motion to move into you executive session. Make a motion. That, I didn't see you. <laughs> I'll make a motion to move an executive session to discuss pending legal matters. You want me to the listed on the agenda. Listed on the, there's three <laughs> items listed on the agenda for today. I apologize. I didn't realize we were having this tonight. No Carry on. Need a second. Need a second and approval. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bognight. Yes. 
Mr. Broom? Yes. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Fuller Will? Mr. Wynn? Yes. Motion passes. First, I guess I need to make a motion that we come out of executive session. Uh, no, no action was taken while in executive session. Second. Vote, please. Mr. Bachnight? Yes. Mr. Broom? Yes. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. All right, y'all are, are readjourned. And then, then I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Thank you. Second? Second. Second. Guys, a vote? I don't think we usually vote on Yes. No, we just do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. What, what